Alrighty guys, so the last time we talked about Chebyshev's rule and how can that can apply to any distribution of any shape, right? And so we've basically seen a lot of different types of distributions, and even with discrete random variables, we saw distributions associated with those too. But now we're going to move on to the normal distribution. So this is one particular type, but we're going to be focusing on this distribution for pretty much the rest of the class. So the normal distribution is another form of a continuous distribution. And by continuous, I specifically mean continuous random variable, right? So continuous random variable CRV. And a normal distribution has three particular qualities. So we saw continuous, it was equally distributed probabilities, right? So every outcome had the equal probability of happening. And now for the normal distribution, it's not equal. And in particular, it's bell-shaped. And what that basically means is you see this one right here, it kind of looks like a bell. That's basically all it is, bell. And another way that some uh, professors or books may write it is mound-shaped. So bell or mound shaped. And it's symmetric to the mean, which remember the mean is given by this fancy looking, it's called a mu, Greek for M. Um, and then the area under the curve is equal to, so what do you think the full area under this curve is gonna be equal to? And so we kind of touched upon this when we said the uniform distribution, right? So the total area under the curve should be equal to one. Why? Because again, if we look at all the area under the curve, that's basically telling us all the probability associated with each possible outcome. And again, each possible outcome, that's basically our sample space. The probability of our sample space is equal to one because again, it takes into account every possible outcome and the probabilities associated with those. And they should all add up to 100%. So, here we have our distribution. In the middle we have our mean. Right? And if you have any issues kind of referring to that, remember again, I have these little boxes that represent each of our um, variables. So mu x is the mean of any random variable x. Uh, and then sigma x is just a standard deviation of that variable too. So this is how I'm going to write it every single time. With any normal distribution, just like you have a first and last name, any normal distribution can be represented by its mean and standard deviation. So you say the normal and then mean and standard deviation like this. Some books may go ahead and note, um, write down the notation for a normal distribution this way. Most don't, and I actually don't even write it there. What I do is I write the midpoint as the mean and also the standard deviation somewhere along the right, um, right sides, just so that I have those very close to the distribution and I know which one represents which one. So that's it for our normal distribution. Bell shaped, symmetric around the mean. We have a standard deviation associated with this. So now let's go ahead and see what the standard deviation does um, with the empirical rule. So the empirical rule helps you make estimations for probabilities using the standard deviation as a ruler. So this may sound very familiar and it should because we just talked about the Chebyshev's rule and it uses also the standard deviation to make some estimations, right? But in particular, this empirical rule is associated with just normal distributions. So how Chebyshev's rule uses standard deviation, right? So we have one standard deviation above and below the mean, two standard deviations above and below the mean, and then three standard deviations above and below the mean. Those probabilities, however, are associated with distributions of any shape. So there's not any conditions or assumptions made about a shape when we're talking about Chebyshev's rule. But with the empirical rule, we're assuming that the distribution is normal. And again, normal, referring back to those three qualities, right? So there's symmetric around the mean, it's bell-shaped, and the area under the whole curve should be equal to one. So between the mean and one standard deviation above and one standard deviation below, we should expect to have 68% of observations, right? And then between the mean above two standard deviations and below two standard deviations, we expect to have 95%. And then three above and three below, we should have 99.7%. So almost 100% of observations should be within three standard deviations of the mean. So again, I'm going to rewrite this here. We have our mean as our midpoint, right? And then we have. 68% of observations are in between one standard deviation above and one standard deviation below. And I'm going to assume that this is, these are all standard deviations, right? So that little gap right there is a standard deviation away. Here's another standard deviation. And we expect to have how many? Should expect to have a little more, right? How much more? Exactly 95. 
Does that make sense? And then one more away. So one more standard deviation away from the mean. We expect to have ninety-nine point seven or point nine nine seven. So 99.7% of observations should lie within three standard deviations. And that kind of makes sense, right? Because as you move further and further away, we see that we basically have more and more observations. So our percentages should be getting higher and higher. So it's very concentrated in the middle. So even though it's only one standard deviation away, it's 68%. As we move further and further away, not as many observations lie within um, those corresponding little segments. And the reason for that is because we see that, again, area corresponds to probability, right? This is a smaller area, this one right here, is a smaller area than these here, right? Because these are higher, and also, again, remember with any normal distribution, it's concentrated around the mean, right? So around the mean, there's a lot of observations. As we move further and further away, there's less and less. And so even though we have 68%, as we move to the next standard deviation above, it actually doesn't go up by that much. And then, from the two standard deviation limit to then the three, even though we're moving to a third standard deviation above, above and below the mean, that number only goes up by 2.7%. I'm sorry, not 2.7, 4.7%. Does that make sense? So even though it's very concentrated in the middle, we have 68%. As we move further and further away, that gap doesn't really change very much. You see that? So that's our empirical rule. Let's go ahead and see if we can apply that to a couple examples. So there's a myth that guys' shoe sizes are proportional to other body parts. Feel free to make whatever assumptions you want. Use your imagination. Assuming the mean and standard deviation of men's shoe sizes are 9 and 2 respectively, what proportion of men should have shoe sizes between 7 and 11? So, again, from here on out, I'm going to highly suggest that you draw uh, pretty much every single time. And so any, any um, problem from here on out that I feel like you need to draw, I'm going to go ahead and put my little normal curve there because I know some people have a hard time drawing it. You can practice it on the side if you want to, that's great, but I like to just have it there so that I don't have to draw it every single time, and it's just very neat and makes my life a lot easier. So, men's shoe sizes have a mean of 9 and a standard deviation of 2. See that? So, that's how I write every single one. I write the mean and standard deviation from the get-go on that distribution so that I know which one's which. And then, what proportion of men should have shoe sizes between 7 and 11? So 7 is over here, 11 is over here, right? And now how many standard deviations away are those two numbers? So if each standard deviation is 2, each of those respective 7 and 11 are just one standard deviation away, right? Does that make sense? So every standard deviation away is two shoe sizes. From 9 to 11 is two shoe sizes, so 11 is one standard deviation away from the mean of 9, right? And the same thing on the other side, just the flip, flip side, right? So 7 to 9 is also a distance of 2, so that means 7 is two standard deviation, I mean, I'm sorry, one standard deviation below 9. And again, all because the standard deviation itself is 2. So we're 2 above, that's one standard deviation. We're 2 below, that's another standard deviation below. So the proportion of men then. 7 is essentially the mean minus a standard deviation. 9 is the mean plus a standard deviation. So that basically tells us that what proportion should fall within between 7 and 11. If it's just one standard deviation, we should have 68% in between those two. Or 0.68. Does that make sense? So, one standard deviation above, one standard deviation below, that's 68% of observations. So let's go ahead and move on to number two. Number two is a little more advanced kind of um, application of this. So women's shoe size is average of seven with a standard deviation of one. So average is seven, so that means the midpoint is seven, standard deviation of one. What is the probability of randomly selecting a woman with a shoe size between eight and nine? So here, 8 is over here, and 9 is also on the right side. So how do we do that? Now the way we do this is, we still have to find how many standard deviations away these two numbers are, right? 
So 8 is 1 standard deviation. 9 is 2 away, so 9 is actually 2 standard deviations away, right? So what we basically have is 8 is the mean plus a standard deviation. 9 is a mean plus 2 standard deviations, right? So what do we do with this? How do we find the probability of selecting a woman between shoe size of 8 and shoe size of 9 when they're both on the same side, right? The way we do this is apply this empirical rule but then splitting these intervals in half. So between negative 1 and 1 is 68%, right? So basically, between 6 and 8 is 68%, right? So let me just write that down. So we should have about 68% or 0.68 of observations should lie between 6 and 8, right? Because there's one standard deviation above and below the mean. But now between just 7 and 8, just 7 and 8 is this section here, right? But that's not represented by that 68%. That 68% is actually twice that one little interval that I'm looking at, right? So between 7 and 8, I should find simply 34% or 0.34. Does that make sense? Because if 68 is between one standard deviation above and below the mean, 34 is from the mean to one on each individual side. Does that make sense? And we're going to apply the same concept to 7 to 9. Because 7 to 9 is two standard deviations away, right? So that means 95% of observations should lie between the mean and two standard deviations above and below. So that means this one here, let me go ahead and highlight this a different color. 7 to 9. Just 7 to 9 alone should be half of that, half of 95% or 0 0.4750 or 475, right? And so 68% is between one standard deviation above and below the mean. So from the mean to one end is 34% or half of that. And then also within two standard deviations is 95%, but just from the mean to the two standard deviations above is 95% over two. Does that make sense? So now we have from 7 to 8 is 0.34, and then from 7 to 9 is 0.475. So how do we find that little area in between? Because the one we're trying to find is between 8 and 9, right? So shade-wise, we're just looking for the blue area. Does that make sense? So the way we find that is we have the bigger one, right? We have 7 to 9. What is that? From 7 to 9, the probability is 0.475, right? So the probability that x is between 8 and 9. So 475 is the big area from 7 to 9. And then we have a little smaller chunk of that is 0.34, right? So to get whatever's left over, all we say is the bigger area minus the smaller area gives me kind of what's left over on the end, right? So 0.475 minus 0.34, and that ends up giving us 0.135. Does that make sense? So again, just to recap, because I know this is a, a hefty concept. So between 6 and 8, there's 68%. If this is supposed to be symmetric, that means from seven to eight and from six to seven, it should be kind of e it should be equal, right? So if it's equal, then each of those little gaps should have 34%, right? So 68% is the whole thing. Each little half ends up being 34%. Same concept goes with nine. So between five and nine, we should have 95%. So that means between five to seven, we have half of that 95%, and then from seven to nine, we have the other half of the 95%. So now we have the probabilities associated with from the mean to 8, and then from the, from the mean, which is 7, to 9, right? So it's 34 and, and 4, 7, 5. Now, the way we find the probability associated with just 8 to 9 is we say 7 to 9 is the bigger gap, right? Minus this little smaller chunk of 34 gives us whatever's left over. And that leftover is that blue area, 8 to 9. Does that make sense? So when we do that, it's 0.475 minus 0.34, and we end up with 0.135. Cool.
So that's about it for the empirical rule. Let's go ahead and do some practice problems to apply this concept, and then we're going to move on to some more advanced stuff with normal distributions.